Right, so my name is Stephanie, Stephanie Taylor, and I work for a company called Mace. Unfortunately, the logo is just up there in the corner. Have you heard of Mace before? Yeah. You have, okay. I'll show you a couple of working or buildings that we'll be working on in a, in a moment. Just a little bit about me. So I've been visiting here for the last four years, we just walked out, and because I've been in the construction industry for about eight. Uh, I actually graduated back in Italy in development studies, and then I came to London, because um, my dad is English and I always wanted to live in London, and I did a master at King's College in environment and development. But really, I never had direct experience in construction. So after that, I was lucky enough, I applied for millions of jobs, but I found a position as an environmental consultant, as an assistant environmental consultant at the time. And everything went from then. I will show you a little bit about MACE and about the opportunity in construction, but if this is something that you're interested in, I think I'm one of the strongest ambassadors because the career opportunities are vast. And if you have already an interest in some aspect of sustainability and construction and engineering, which I guess is why you need to find, then I would really recommend to, to go down the way of working for a contractor. But I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, so what we're covering today uh, it's not a recruitment campaign, but I will tell you a little bit about Mace. It's a great company, so perhaps something to keep in mind, um, whether you want to change a job or whether you're looking for a job in the future. I'll also talk you through what sustainability at Mace means and what we do about it. Now, the first three years I did this course, we used to call it industrial symbiosis, but whether you agree or not, that term, at least in the construction industry, is not used. If I go to my project manager, project director, to discuss industrial symbiosis, they think I'm talking a different language. So circular economy is something that people have started to hear more about it, because it's part of the government agenda as well, which I will show you in a second. So I'll tell you a little bit about that in terms of what people think about circular economy and construction. Then I'll tell you what we think, as MACE, about circular economy. A couple of examples on how we've applied it, and this is like real case scenarios. And then to finish off the good, the bad and the ugly about the circular economy into the construction. This is very real, this is based on facts. I'm not here to tell you that everything is wonderful. There's a few challenges around circular economy and hopefully we can have a little bit of debate around that. And then a very short conclusion. And hopefully this ties in well with one of your objectives from the course, which is this understanding the challenges in moving towards a more circular system of consumption and production. And I think we are more into the production line at the moment as the construction industry. MACE, okay, so what are we? We are a rather large construction and consultancy firm. Only 20 years old, we haven't been around for long, but we've grown exponentially. There's loads of people working for MACE, 5,000, all around the world, and I'll show you where. So as part of our services, we invest in properties, we do consultancy, which means we work for the client, and we would manage a contractor. We do obviously a lot of construction, which is where I spend a lot of time, where we are actually building stuff. And then we operate, this is to do with facilities management, people looking after building, maintaining them, etc., etc. So, no matter where you are in the world, you'll find a MACE building or office. As you can see, we have five hubs from the America to London, Doha, Hong Kong, and Johannesburg. And this slide comes from about five months ago. So, at the moment, you're looking at about 5,000 people across the world uh, working for Vinci. A rather large turnover, and what we're looking at by 2020 is to double that. This is why it is a really great place to work. It's an exciting time for us at base. And let me show you a couple of things that we have built or are in the process of building. Any guests? What do you think this is? It is. We have a lot of work going on at Heathrow. We've done a lot of work. We've got six more years of work and upgrades and maintenance to do there. And guess this is what made Mays famous. Thank you very much. You won't believe it. People told me the Tower Bridge, like we haven't been that. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't been um, around that long. Absolutely, the shards. That was finished in 2012. Tallest building in Europe. It was put together in Yorkshire first to make sure it worked <laughs> before we did it here. Yeah, especially with the, the height, not with the glass, but the steel 
we had to make sure we got it right. So in the middle of nowhere, up north, all the bits got put together, yeah, it works, and then we brought it up to London. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting facts about the shard, but that's what really brought the maze to the world, in a way. We were around before, but I think since then, 2012, people started hearing more about us. What about this one? I think it speaks to himself, if you can read it. Birmingham. This is still being built, we are getting there, but this is just to show some major projects on infrastructure outside of London. Any idea what this is? Yeah, nobody gets this. I mean, you probably recognize it from maybe, or oh, unless you've been there recently, because this is part of a business mission. We just did it the first day of uh, evening class. Oh, did you? We just talked about the facade and how it's north. Oh, fantastic. Hopefully the maze holdings were not in the way. I think uh, we will be finished by then, because this is quite a recent um, piece of work that we finished. Oh, good. I'm surprised. Like, nobody, nobody ever gets this. Excellent. Uh, again, this speaks for itself, but did you know maze built the, um, the cable car across the River Thames? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so have you been on it? No. It's a really good experience. The oh, view crazy. is amazing. It's slow. <laughs> it's quite slow. But the view is fantastic. It's an experience you've got to do. If you're in London, take the cable car. You can go to North Greenwich and the Jubilee Line and then take a tour on the cable car. We also maintain it, so that's where we operate infrastructure as well. How about this? This is quite a difficult one. So this is a major London station. And this is where they play Wicked at the theatre. Victoria, I don't know if you've been around there recently, it's a nightmare because um, we are building this massive office and residential development, we're halfway through. Uh, London Underground is redeveloping the whole station, so traffic wise and building operations is not a, a very nice place at the moment, but this is how it's going to look uh, in a couple of years time. Just to give you an idea of the scale of the project that we get involved in. You can recognise this one hopefully. Yeah, the Olympic Park, Queen Elizabeth Park. So Mace was the client side. So we managed the works at the Olympics. Again, not many people um, know this. How about this? If you look at this, you might. Is that No. This is on the south bank. You keep walking. Is this the, the, um, it's the art? Is it Tate? Tate? Yeah. So this is a complete new space that we're building behind the Tate. Fascinating design. This is concrete. So the shape of it, obviously with a facade, but the main base is still on concrete. It's not finished yet, but if you walk past it over a weekend, you, you see it. Because it's nearly there. It's still being built. Right, okay. 70%? Is that why it's not hiding? We are about halfway through. No, a bit more, a bit more than halfway through. This is a picture of how it's going to look. Is it by someone I did not Looks like it's well. No, I, I'm not too sure about the detail, but it's quite a stunning structure. I would really recommend to walk by if you get a chance. You don't obviously have to enter the construction site, you can just walk around it and you can really see it. And then, a couple more. Oh, well, I think this is an easy one to guess. This is the Battersea Power Station. Fantastic building. Um, unfortunately, we did the enabling works, um, which was to do with some of the contamination in the soil, because it's full <laughs> of, uh, of nasty um, ingredients, let's say. But unfortunately, Skanska won the rest in terms of the residential. They are one of our biggest competitors. But we were involved for a little bit of time in there as well. This is a difficult one. This is King's Cross though, it's not far from here. It's the Greater Northern Hotel. It's a very famous cocktail bar, <laughs> part of a hotel, but we do a lot of fit out as well. It's just to show you the variety of projects. This is a difficult one, but Montenegro, so we go beyond the boundary of the UK. Some work in Qatar as well, Hong Kong. Quite a lot of work in Hong Kong at the moment. And then this one, the last one, it's Kingdom Tower, Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you've heard about this. We've just done the foundations at the moment. This is going to be three times the shard in terms of height. It's 
nearly a kilometer long in terms of height. Absolutely massive. It's going to be the highest building in the world once it's finished. It's higher than Burj Khalifa. Sorry? It's higher than Burj Khalifa. Yes, it will be. The tallest in the world. Until somebody else builds another one, you know, that, that's how it goes. Okay, but really, just to give you an idea of some really exciting projects you can get involved with, even if you work in the sustainability side around the world. Sustainability at MACE, a very brief overview. What you see above is the statements that we've built to describe the way we think about sustainability. We took a stance in that we really want to be seen as a leader, not just in the way that we do the business, but also what we do for our clients. This is from our uh, internet page, so if you want to find out about MACE a little bit more, you just type it in. This is our director of sustainability, quite well known around the business. And what we've done since 2012, we've built up a strategy on how we do business and sustainability within MACE. And don't worry about the detail, but really just to explain how businesses work. It comes from the way that we work. So our building in the city, we have a, an office in Moorgate, and we refitted it. So we as MACE. And all the carpets, all the furniture that we use, all the ventilation is as sustainable as you can get. It's just a way to show that we believe in what we preach. The beautiful offices, when our clients come in, they can breathe sustainability. We invest our own money to make it as green as you can. Are you familiar with Brium? Yes, it's a really high Brium standard as well. Then the next phase, obviously, we work in a lot of sites, so it is really important that we implement best practice at all times. And this is from keeping noise to a minimum, to keeping the the roads are clean to let neighbours know that we're doing works, etc, etc. But then, because we are expanding quite a lot, I don't know if you can read it, but that's to do with community programmes. So we're doing a lot of work with volunteering and charitable donations, so there's a lot more than the RAC in construction. And then finally, all of this is what allows us to be the best in what we do for our client. That's what, or you know, how we like to be seen. So as you can see, this was a three-year plan which was done in 2012, which is um, just before, well, I joined soon after. And we were working towards these objectives. So as a company, we have clear objectives which are divided into waste, carbon, responsibly sourced material, community, biodiversity, which is quite an interesting one, not every construction company cares about this aspect, and water. And when I joined, this was quite refreshing because it's a strategy, there are objectives to meet, and at the moment we're working towards the next three years. We have to do all the calculation at the end of this year to see how we're doing. When it comes to circular economy, these two, really, in terms of targets, is what matters to us. And I'll explain about that in a bit more detail. And then this is just to show you that, you know, we actually share with the world what we do and how we do it through the annual report. So if you're interested, you can go online, search for MACE, you can find all this information. Okay, so that's it. Just a little bit about MACE so that um, everybody knows. Circular economy in construction. I don't know how much you know in terms of what people say about it, specifically in construction. So I picked a few headlines, which are quite recent. So construction needs it. That's what the experts, if you want, say. The problem is, as it says there, it's like monopoly, everyone is losing. The industry must shift its emphasis beyond recycling and towards reuse. Ten years ago, we were very bad at recycling. Now, we're very good at recycling. Now, we need to go on to the next phase, which is the reuse, which is not as good as it could be. So people are telling us that we need it, and that's mainly, if you have heard of it, of the 2025 construction strategy, the industrial strategy, that's backed by the government who wants the industry to meet certain targets, including, apologies if you can't read, a 50% in reduction of carbon emissions. And one way to do that is to reuse materials rather than creating new ones and using virgin materials, etc., etc. So no matter what Maze does or Skanska or whoever, the industry as a whole needs to respond to the government in about 10 years' time with results. And there might be fines associated with not meeting certain results. So as an industry, all of us need to do something to improve the way we're working. 
government is interested in construction because it brings a lot of money to the economy. It's what's driving it in a way. And this is just another example of what people say. I think if I can pick just a couple, don't worry about reading at all. But the one in pink. So the idea of a circular economy where everything is built with reuse in mind and endlessly recycled is gaining traction. It's gaining traction, it's not happening as such or not as much as we would like in the construction industry. Other industries are slightly different. Somebody else is saying a circular economy, a traditional line of process is take, make, dispose, which is true, a bit old fashioned, but that's the traditional model. But obviously, we want to move to a place where there is no waste because everything is reused. Before we get into any more detail, can I ask what you think? And to make it easy, on a scale from 1 to 10, one, where you think that the circular economy does not exist at all, we don't do anything about it. Or ten, that we really nailed it, we really got it, we really know what we're talking about it. What do you think applies? So the UK probably have number two. Yeah. Monica? Don't worry, there's no right wrong uh, answer, it's just to get your perception of it. <laughs> it, it's really just to get you thinking, and, and you're right, you know, we're, we're nowhere near here. I wouldn't say one, that would be too negative, but we're probably around the three, three to four, I would say. There's quite a lot more work to be done. So, in a summary, and this is an article I'm going to show you, which was published on the 13th of March. What does the industry say? So, what do we say? 88% of sustainability professionals say that industry is failing short on circular economy. And it's true, we are lacking some enablers, and I'll show you which ones those are. We are thinking about it, we're talking about it, we are implementing it in a certain extent, but it's not where we would like it to be. It's not where Rolls Royce is or where other industries are yet. So this is what I meant, you know, when I said this presentation is going to be quite real. I can't tell you that the world is perfect and we're great at this. This is the reality of it, in our experience. However, there is a very important organisation, which is the UKCG. If you work in the construction industry, you will definitely come across it, because it's a body which is made of representative from each company in the construction, who influence government. So if there's a policy to be adopted, we have the power from the UKCG to influence decisions. And as of this year, it started, to be honest, it started in 2014, but it's not until February this year, that a specific group has been dedicated just to look after the circular economy. And so happens, Andrew Kinsey is my boss. He's leading that group, uh, which tied in quite well with um, this year's presentation because he shared with me what we've done so far in terms of sort of industry efforts. But the first thing that he declared is that in essence, you know, super car is fundamentally different to what we currently do. There is no waste in a super economy because everything is obviously being reused. Unfortunately the whole industry is a long way from that ideal at the moment. However we put your measures in place to make sure that this will happen. How long it will take the answer right now. I'd like to see you next year and say we've got it. I think it can take a little bit longer than that. So what does it mean to us? So this is a, a business perspective of circular economy. The UKCG in a very simple illustration has summarized it as a transition from the take, make, dispose to what goes around comes around. To the reuse of resources. And I think because you do this course, you're probably already familiar with industrial symbiosis and super economy uh, concept. This circle, you know, the smaller it is, bigger the, the benefits are. So this is the interpretation of the UKCG. Moving from waste, basically, to resource. However, 
in a company like Mace and in a lot of others, our focus is on waste and reducing waste. We don't necessarily think of the resource. The first concern is waste. So wherever you work in the construction industry, there is a so-called waste hierarchy to apply. We start from reducing waste, to reusing, to recycling, to recovering, basically when you send waste to be incinerated and create energy, and finally to dispose. These are the worst options. What we want to do is reuse as much as possible. In here, in construction, the circular economy, you see it's mentioned there, comes at the level of reuse. But as you can see, in the industry at the moment, we, we don't talk about resource first, we talk about waste already. We already know what is going to be waste and what we're going to be doing with it. You know, as an industry of engineers, we're very good at finding solutions. The shift needs to be where you avoid the solution, sorry, you avoid the problem before it comes. So why waste? Why do you think waste is really a big issue for us as an industry? That's, yeah, that's one of them. Mainly is because we produce a lot of it. This always helps. It's enough to fill the Albertall every day. That's the amount of waste just produced in construction. It's a huge amount. And on top of that, we also use most of the resources for actually building things. On top of that, one thing to consider is the cost of disposing of waste. So if you're on a construction site, you have a skip which you fill with waste and then somebody comes and collects it and that might be £600 usually as an average. However, there is a huge amount of hidden cost, that's why we call it the iceberg theory, where the costs are doubled so that the money that we spend on waste are huge and people don't necessarily see it as a direct cost necessarily because it's not as visible as spending three millions of concrete over you know, six months. But over time, we've been actually looking at how much we spend in maize, in waste, and everybody was quite shocked. And it's to do with the deficiencies at times, and over-ordering material, and damaging material. There's a number of reasons. The cost is a key driver. So what we do, we set targets to compare ourselves against the industry. And without worrying about too much about the detail, these targets are around how much waste we produce in the first place, how much we recover, how much we recycle, how much, how much we send to landfill. This is really just to give you an idea of what the construction does. So the focus really is on reducing the waste at the moment. As Monique mentioned before, one of the drivers for paying so much attention on waste is cost, but also legislation. Clients, some more mature clients, if you want, who have got a real key interest in sustainability, will set some really tough targets on us to meet, which is usually around waste production. So we need to come up with a design or a type of material which will reduce the waste just as much as possible. So usually when you go for prefabrication or timber structures, that comes with a very low waste rates because of the nature of, of the element in the building. The problem is we're still producing too much waste. We need to go away from that. And the problem is, you know, is it waste or is it a resource? And construction, old school in a, bit, in a way, but it's improving a lot, has always seen the focus on waste. And as you can see here, there's many things that we do which are great, but we need a cultural shift from waste to resource, which allows that shift from take, make, dispose to what goes around and comes around, so called. These are the things that we do. You know, we do design out waste, we do the life cycle assessment, we call the material passports where we select materials that are better than other, for example, in terms of carbon, carbon, carbon. Uh, we write waste management plans, we have policies in place. But at the end of the day, the whole focus is again reducing waste. So the challenge for us is just shifting from the waste focus to the resource. So what does that mean, theory into practice? We have started applying some of the, sim or the principle of the circular economy, but I think it's more fair to say that it's a sermon circular economy, mainly because we end up with a problem, and as I said before, we find a solution. So we, we do find a solution, but we don't close the loop and reuse that material necessarily, having thought about it before. 
hopefully the examples will make more sense. Very easily, the first thing we started doing, uh, we have a huge network of projects where we have loads of things that you can actually even see in this room that at the end of the project are no longer needed. But we haven't bought a screen or we haven't bought furniture with the idea in mind that these one day will go to somebody else. Before, we would just sort of give them away, not think about it too much. You know, I'm talking about five, ten years ago. Now we have a network within the company and scans can do the same where every single piece of furniture at the end of a project, because you know you have a temporary setup when you build something, will be allocated to another project that's about to start off. So it's not sort of a closed loop as such, but it's somewhere towards that. And the reason why it's successful is because we started quantifying on project by project how much money, how much tons of carbon has saved. And that's where you get the backing from project directors because it's important in the construction industry to have the leadership behind you when you try to implement change. It's got to be driven from the top. So this is a very, very simple example. You know, the reuse of office furniture from the Shard, Cafe Royale, Park House, which are other main buildings in, the, in London. This is the amount of money that's saved, the amount of waste that's been reduced, etc., etc. And we use these things in bids when we try and win more work demonstrate to the client that we do things to you know, lower the environmental impact of construction. And we've actually did a little bit of work. This is a result of one of your colleagues last year, Harrison. You pulled together all the savings that we've done, everything that's moved from one place to the other, how much money that's saved, and we were able to work out over half a million savings. That was very well received by the company. You know, these are things that usually are never quantified, so even just spending some time in looking at how much money we spent, how much tables we, tons of carbon we've avoided by having to get rid of the stuff and buy some new one, which is what usually happened. It's quite a nice finding. This is actually why I put it up. I just realized that it was uh, Harrison that did it, which was one of uh, your colleagues from the last year course. This is another example, it's very different but is applied on a project. You might recognize King's Cross Station a few years ago, loads of redevelopment work. There was a strategy, so this is more thought through. There was actually a requirement from the client, and well, also from the Heritage Association, to, to retain all the bricks, because they're historical, they are important, and in that way, as you can see here, all of them have been sold and then reused to build something else. Same thing, we had to get rid of quite a lot of old you know, sinks and toilets. Well, we found a charity that was just in need of some very simple furniture to build temporary shelters and the like. That was perfect. We haven't started the project thinking that, oh, at the end of it, the bricks will go here, the toilets will go there. We dealt with it at the end of it. So I think that's where we need to get better. So we start thinking about these things earlier so you already know what to do at the right time. I mean, another good example, this was, um, through NISP, actually. Have you ever heard of NISP? The National Industrial Symbiosis Program? Uh, it was an organization that we used to work with a few years ago. No longer, unfortunately, because um, I'm not too sure if they exist anymore. Uh, well, they exist, but they are very really, really because they, uh, they lost the funding. They lost the funding. They lost the funding. Yeah. yeah, of course. Which is a real shame. Basically, it was a small organization that created bridges and relationship between us, the industry, and lots of other organizations. And this is an example of what NISP helped doing with my previous company. So this is the Nottingham um, Guardian Busway being built. And there was a company nearby that had this huge amount of tires that didn't know what to do with it. And NISP managed to work out that we needed to fill in. You see these gaps in between the tracks with a material which would allow water to go through and was good enough to meet the engineering specifications if you want. But long story short, they did a bit of analysis and they shredded all the tires, and all of that was reused along the tracks. Again, it was more of finding a solution to a problem rather than thinking it beforehand, because the original design required a lot of recycled aggregate to be imported as a backfill, which is a lot of use of resources. So this would have been, was a waste already, but we use it as a resource. Another example, and this is on the uh, B Sky B, so you know Sky, obviously, in the television. We are rebuilding their head offices. 
uh, we're actually still doing it. I've been there for about a year. And they are very keen on sustainability and pushed us, so this is where the client influence is important, to find ways to always reduce environmental impact. And we worked out a very simple calculation, excuse me, that by raising the level of the building by 400 millimeter, we avoid a lot of refill and reusing material, which worked out, you know, nearly 150,000 pounds. It's in the middle of the world, there was no issues with the height of the building, so not growing from a planning perspective, easy. But again, trying to find a solution rather than doing it this in advance. A very similar example, again, on another project, uh, this was a police station. Um, they had to sort of get rid of all the um, initial layer, if you want. And usually, because you need a space on a construction project, you just get rid of it and then you order some new material in. But this was pre-planned. They found a space on site where they kept all of this material, and when they had to do a bit of landscape at the end of the project, they just reused it and then covered it with a topsoil. So that was a good example of, I guess, semicircular economy, because it was done at the very beginning with the end in mind. Another example here is where you've got a project. When you do um, some piling works, for example, you usually have to build what's so-called a piling mat, which is made of recycled aggregate and crushed concrete. And again, usually you dig out and then you bring in recycled aggregate to do the piling mat. But luckily here, we had to do a bit of demolition and we brought in a concrete crusher so that we reused the concrete that was there already to then build a piling mat. Rather than having to get rid of the concrete we broke and then bring in some crushed concrete from somewhere else. So you've got a carbon saving from the transport and obviously the use of resources. So this is another quite good example of some significant savings there. And then this is another slightly different one, but not that. This was a previous demolition project. So at Sky, actually, where we're working now, before Sky, Harrods had a warehouse. And Sky asked a contractor to demolish the warehouse, but to leave the broken concrete on site. So they did that and then they walked away. And then a few months later we got involved. But that's where the client already knew that we would have needed a piling mat and they've allowed that to happen. And they just said, yeah, just use that. Which was great, that was client-led. So it's a slightly different perspective. And it's great because we save money, we save environmental impacts, etc., etc. A slightly different type of material. Um, well, it's a bad story turned into a good story, I guess. Because of the footprint of the building, we had to get rid of quite a lot of vegetation, like over 20 tons of trees. Uh, some of them were not in very good condition, admittedly, but still, sort of, I wasn't very happy about it because it was the only green space we had. We are replanting a lot of them, but at least we were able to reuse them and we still had them stored on site as part of the future landscape. So when we finish the building, there is a huge area to be landscape on the outside, and there is a so-called wilderness area, where they have a pond, and then this wild uh, habitat, which is made of broken tree trunks to facilitate stag beetles and things like that to grow in it. It's a bit outside of the box, but it saved us having to get rid of the timber, and it's there ready for use when we finish the landscape. Again, it's very simple ideas, but worked very well. And then one of the last example, I had loads, but I just thought I'd use some of the most significant ones. This is the, the Sky Academy. So if you look, if you watch Sky, you probably hear about the Sky Academy lately. And we had to install some raised access flooring. And this came from our subcontractor. So we asked our subcontractor to come up with a good idea of reusing materials. And they had stopped in their courtyard or in their sort of, um, main uh, offices loads of tiles from a previous project that they where they demolished the whole building and they said well we'll reuse those it doesn't matter because we were covering them with carpets at the end so that was actually a really really good win for both sides they didn't have to buy new ones we didn't have to pay for new ones they just put them in and they're fine even if they were used before you know at the end of the day you cover them it's like we were talking about earlier on reusing steel it's just a simple and easy, obviously, in this uh, circumstance we're talking about quite small quantities, but easy win. So I hope that gives you a bit of an idea of how circular economy works in construction. The good, the bad and the ugly about it, 
So what, why do you think we want to do more about it? Why do you think it's good for us in construction? Any ideas? From what you've seen? What does, what does it save us? Save us money? What else? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The client like it, the end consumer like it. So, you know, there's quite a good list of why we should be doing more and more. Cost savings, increased pressure on natural resources, you know, enhanced sustainability. This is quite a key one, you know, if people start doing this more and more through collaboration and partnership, then it'll become more of a normal practice, if you want. Obviously, reputation, but also that industrial strategy I showed you at the very beginning helps the industry working towards that. So this is all the good stuff. However, there is some bad stuff. One of the biggest issues that we have is the definition of waste. So you know I talked before about how much focus is on waste in construction. The definition of it is that if you have something that you want to discard off, that's immediately waste. So if it's something that you no longer need, that becomes waste. If somebody needs it somewhere else, to us it's still waste because we want to get rid of it. But the legislation allows you to ask for certain exemptions to allow somebody else to come and pick up your waste, to use it as a resource. Because usually you have to be registered as a waste carrier, you need to be audited. There's a lot of paperwork for you to do stuff with waste. So it puts a lot of people off. So if you had something you no longer need, say you had very simple terms, you had a building, you had a couple of extra um, timber plank that I can do with in another building, I need to be registered as a waste carrier. I need to do register my site for accepting waste before I can even approach you with the idea. Cost me money, cost me time, not modern. I'm gonna get some new timber from the shop, it's easier. They are changing it, so things are better now. Five years ago, it was a nightmare, you know, three months to uh, even apply for these sort of licenses. At the moment, you can get one in, in five days turnaround. Because I realized it made it so difficult. It's to avoid things like people getting rid of soil with asbestos in it. Oh yeah, this is good soil, you can use it on top of your you know, garden, whatever. It's good to go. There were issues where people were sort of taking advantage of that. So it's getting better, but it is still a bit of an issue. The time scales on the logistics. So, you know, if I need a bit of wood at the time where you're finishing, great. But if it's in three months' time, you're not going to keep hold of your wood waste. You're just going to get rid of it because you need to clear half the area. So, for us, it's still a bit short term rather than long term. You know, we get told to build something with the end in mind. But to us, the end in mind is the day that we give you the keys of the building that we've built and then we walk away. You know, there you go, Mr. Klein, this is a wonderful building for you, just like you wanted it or better, but then we usually walk away. We don't think about, what about the elements once the building life expires in 60 years? We're not there yet. That will be one day where we get to. So it's short term, you know, get built, deliver, move to the next. Construction is a really fast industry. That's why long term objectives can be hard sometimes. Insurance issues, so that's another thing to consider. And then, how do you actually measure the benefit? Because we haven't done that much, people, directors, people that make decisions, don't understand the value of investing in circular economy. So that's why we started quantifying all these things that we do. So the post that I showed you earlier, we use that so much in bids and corporate reports and you know, publicity, because it actually shows that we are doing something about it. And that's really key to start measuring those benefits and cost savings. The ugly is not ugly as such. I call it ugly because these are probably the, the most challenging things to change. So what the industry is doing at the moment? Design and procurement. So many times as a contractor, you get given a design that you need to work to. There's very little you can do to change it. You can suggest a different material. You can suggest a different, I don't know, uh, air unit. But the design is there, the type of building, the footprint. Etc. etc. It comes from the client. So there's a bit of exercise to do with developers and clients, etc. etc. to change the idea. Not let's build a building like for IKEA or Sainsbury or whatever. 
that we know once it comes to the end of it, 60 years time, we can take all the steel structure from within and just use it for another one. Construction is not there yet. Although we do work for the same marine the assets, so hopefully from that partnership some of these ideas can come through. Lack of knowledge and awareness, you know, a lot of people done, as I said before, in Rusty Symbiosis, very few people know what that means in construction. Circular economy, people start now knowing about it, but not, not a lot. There's a little bit of exercise to do that to let people know. That's why it's important for you guys to, to know about this stuff, because then when you join the industry, for you it will be the way that things are done. Supply chains so are the people we buy stuff from. That's a really strong focus that we need to do as an industry, just get them to talk to each other and help us finding solution. And then finally, you know, the perception of the client and the end users. Previously used reclaimed recycled materials may be perceived as inferior to new ones. So there's a little bit of cultural, you know, change there as well. So it's not ugly as such, but what I meant is that these are quite challenging to change. So coming to an end now, you know, what, what are we doing about it? It's not that we just say it's too difficult. There's actually quite a lot of work going behind the scene. One of them is our work as a sustainability professional with the client in finding a solution. Procurement strategy, we've got quite a strong focus on that. Obviously there is the industry strategy for construction, but mainly what the UK CUG role is doing, the UK contractors group. Because those guys can really talk to the, uh, to the government. And you won't be able to see this in details, but I will send you a copy of the presentation. This hasn't been shared with anyone yet. This is a new document that's been produced about um, a week ago from the UKCG group, which demonstrate where we are exactly as an industry. This is not just nice. But it talks about circular economy. It talks about existing practices, which is what I showed you with the examples, what we already do. These are existing examples of best practice and pilot programs. So for example, pre-cycling. Have you heard about the term pre-cycling? That's where you know you use a material and usually you recycle it at the end of it. This is where you, you pre-think about how you can reuse that material at the end of it rather than recycling it. Just just reuse it. It's just a slightly different concept. Uh, the whole life cycle costing, resource reclaim and recycling. So this is not standard practice, this is best practice. And these are the enables, you know. A lot of the yellow ones are innovation. So a lot of companies don't do this yet. So this is where our focus is. This is where ideally we would like to be. So as you can see, it's all innovation, 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 innovation. Using smart materials, innovative revenue models, so that's to do with insurance and leasing and cost. Asset tracking of materials and components, so understanding the value of materials and what comes up at the end of the building. Information management and materials passports. Until we don't quantify it, this thing would be impossible to do. And then service performance leasing instead of ownership. So in all Royals, Royals, they, they sell flying hours rather than airplanes. That's the same principle that ideally, in some shape or form, would be applied to construction eventually. So we're working on it. You know, it is a really important subject for us. We're sort of still working out how best to implement it. And some of it would be through people like you, you know, UCL, where you do the actual research and you enable some of the relationship between industry partners. And some of it will have to be from us, obviously, with leadership, as we said before. You know, these groups are absolutely key. You've probably heard about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation for, for the future. These guys are quite a strong catalyst for change. And we are doing some work with them, not probably as much as we could. But then your role, really, you guys, if you go into construction, this is what we need you to take forward in a way. We'll try and facilitate as much as possible, but we need people with a fresh, sort of different state of mind. You see what I mean? You know, with a waste, it took about 10 years to go from very low percentage of diversion from landfill to nowadays 95% average. People are very good at diverting waste from landfill because it saves them money. So it happened, you know, 10 years ago people thought, oh no, that's too difficult, we're never going to do it. And it's the same thing with the circular economy. I think in 5, 10 years we will see a, a very big shift if the government still backs it up though. It needs a little bit of that as well. 
So this is it from me, guys. One other thing I wanted to point out, um, we have a graduate development program every year. Uh, this is the online um, page that tells you all about it. It's not just the sustainability. You have a whole list of fields. So you can apply for engineering, you can apply for project management, etc., etc. And it's one of the best ways to get into the industry. It's a two-year program where you get exposed to everything in construction. They give you a lot of training, a lot of mentoring, etc., etc. while you learn the job. And then usually, you know, 99%, you have a career guarantee after that. It's not easy to get through. There's like two levels of assessment. There's an initial CV review, then there is a first interview, and then, and then there is actually a practical exercise. So it's not an easy process, but if you're keen about construction, if you do your research on the company, have a look on the deadlines in terms of timings, etc. It'll be for next year, obviously, for you guys, because you're still through um, your master. But it's a very good way to get into it. Or if you already have experience, not and trying to <laughs> motivate you from your employer, not at all. But we are recruiting quite, quite a lot, let's say, at the moment. We, we just need a lot of people. It's a very good company and it's expanding quickly. And it's a good place to be. They do take sustainability seriously. They invest in it and they want to push for continuous improvement. So circular economy, I'm sure we'll be dealing it with more and more. And hopefully with your colleagues next year, I can tell them, you know, we've made a big jump from 2015. And circular economy now is every procurement package, et cetera, et cetera. Hopefully, hopefully, slowly, but we'll get there. So I know there's a lot of information to download, but do you have any questions, any, any comments? Okay, so, you know, we need do you to have any kind of commitment with that? Okay. Uh, well, the UKCG, part of uh, their role is to make commitments to the government that the associate members will work towards meeting those targets. Okay. So, so they are not binding, but they are kind of... Yes, they're a little bit, I don't say flexible, but mm -hmm. it's still a commitment. It's signed by directors, not just, just ours, you know, it's like senior people. Is there anything people. on, on targets around? Uh, yes, so energy and carbon, yes, because there is that 50% reduction to meet. Yeah, so uh, it's more about um, using power from the grid, using diesel, etc., etc. Because obviously with the but you don't take into account the embedded carbon. We do, but I mean in the in the subject. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, you do, you do, you do. Okay. That's why some of the reuse of materials and all that sort of stuff would mm -hmm. would help in yeah. that target. Mm -hmm. But you know, we, we are unclear at the moment that, about who is going to collect all the data and, and report that back. Mm -hmm. Is it the UKCG? That, that's a voluntary organisation. You know, people mm -hmm. volunteer to do a bit of research. But yeah, so there's a little bit of work to do. I mean, that's why you know, mm -hmm. working with universities and the like help us because you have that structure to do the research and capturing data, etc., etc. Because they have they have the obligation to report. As a company, we do that anyway. Yes, uh, but it's like but it's more of a company own client requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, but by 2025, we will have to report to the UKCG through this commitment, okay. and the UKCG will represent the industry to say we reduce carbon emissions by 30%. Okay. Yeah, but they will not be possible for everything. Not yet. We'll see with the new government whether they're going to put something more tangible and restrictive. Yeah. It's something, but it's probably not strong enough. Because you're right, early on, the industry has got all these pushes and they have to do it. Mm -hmm. And then it happens. Mm -hmm. A bit more difficult for the industry. <laughs> okay. I noticed you have very, uh, lots of exciting projects for yeah. your role. And um, it may have any interest in China or uh, At the moment, we're working a lot in uh, Hong Kong and Macau. Uh, we won the job today in Vietnam. I was just reading on the uh, on the news in the company. Um, we are expanding. I'm not saying day by day, but we have worked in China before. Uh, I think it was a couple of years ago. I can't quite remember on what. But if you go, if you literally Google Maze Group and you go on the projects, it gives you a whole list of, of where where we work. And probably you can also find the contacts because we have people based around the world. Are you from China? Yeah. Are you thinking of going back then for your career afterwards? Yeah, yeah well, have a look, you know. Drop me an email if we have any contacts that you can speak to. 
I'll put you in touch because um, I've run out of business cards, but I will send. Oh, you have my presentation. Yeah. I'll yeah. If you send my uh, yeah. my email. Yeah. You know that, that's what we try and help with because um, if somebody in May receives an email for somebody who's interested about the company, that will always be well received. You know, you have to be audacious and just approach a company. It's it's good. It's a good thing to do. Not many people do it at all. You know, I'm not saying write to the CEO, but <laughs> <laughs> write a letter of interest, you know, and then if you go on the careers, there are a lot of ways um, through which you can get into May. So you can do industrial placement as part of your um, career, sorry, as part of your degree. You can do the graduate development after you graduate. Uh, you can do work experiences for like a week, etc. So there's, there's different things you can do. So you can have a look and then just ask me questions direct or open to reason. I'm more than happy to help. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to check with Colbert to change from what usually a contractor is not usually sustainable, but it's not sustainable, but it's also meant that the worker in practice, the worker needs to be trained in yes. a sustainable way. Yes, that is a, a very so good point. point. It's quite a work of training them. Yes. Or there's a standard of government of doing that to there isn't a, a government standard as such. It is a really good point and a very hot topic because on some of the major projects I've shown you, we're talking about 700 people on a site every day. And construction can be rough. Construction is long hours in the winter and in the you know and the people can be you know they're quite tough people if you want to put it that way. But in terms of educating them, I don't want to use the word educating, but just for simplifying things, in terms of protecting materials, not wasting, etc, etc. We have a particular salvage, uh, like how, how they salvage the materials, so it's important to use it again. Exactly. There is a lot of things that happen, so there are trainings, there are things called toolbox talks, where basically in small groups every week, one of the project managers will talk to them about how to protect materials to make sure that sheetings are used to cover bricks after they finish working, to make sure that concrete is not left if it rains, etc, etc. Mm -hmm. But we're far away from making sure they do that without being told. Mm -hmm. So reason being, the absolute key priority in construction is health and safety. So there is a huge amount of work being done on behavioural change for health and safety, because we want to reduce, obviously, any injury we want to reduce, we want to avoid them but there's still a high rate of injuries across the industry. So all the behavioral change programs, which take the people off site for even a week to go for something different, are mainly on health and safety at the moment. We are doing some quite an innovative program, they're called no waste programs, which are to do with waste. They started them at the Olympics. They get some traction and they get some results, but you have to keep repeating them. Because, you know, the guys at the end of the day, they just want to do their job, they pay by the hours, the more they can do, you know, the quicker they can do it, that's it for them. It's a difficult one, because there's not a lot in, so what we do, is about energy. I got certified by some training or, I don't Yes, but it's very easy. So there is, everybody that works on the site needs to have a CSCS card, um, which is basically a card that allows you to be inducted on a site and actually work on a site. To have that CSCS card, you need to do a test, which has 50 questions. Three of them are about environment. This is like industry, UK wide. It's standardized. Everybody has to get yeah, yeah, it's like a legislation. And you can't work on a site without a CSCS. Well, in a lot of industry, in a lot of construction, you should never be allowed to. Because it's a basic understanding of the health and safety rules, even if English is not your first language, you know, what the sign look like, what do they mean, what to do in the event of a fire, etc, etc. So obviously it's heavy on health and safety. However, the UKCG, as of two years ago, one of the group was doing the training and they put together something called SEAT, which is a, basically a site environmental awareness training course. And all the site supervisors need to go through it. And those are people working on site. And as the UKCG members, we are making it um, compulsory for the company that work for us to make sure that their guys go through that training. But that's done to us. It's not um, a legislation. That's just us trying to improve the industry. 
Does that answer your question? You know, just drop me an email. A few of the students I met last year, some of them got in touch a couple of days after we'd a couple of queries. So feel free to drop us an email if you have a question about MACE or about the circular economy in MACE or whatever it could be.